Should be an interesting one here uh, for us personally. Purdue, congratulations, 87-66. An assembly hall stomping is what I would call it. The better team won. They won decisively. They led throughout. This was a blowout for much of this game. It was a huge blowout at half. Indiana made a spirited comeback tease, I would say, to start the second half. But I don't think they ever got closer than nine points and Purdue Purdued their way to a victory after that. Uh, we have a lot of thoughts on this. I think our thoughts may or may not annoy some Purdue fans based on our dialogues privately leading up to this. I hope that's not the case because I really love our Purdue audience. And I'm trying not to be sour grapes about this, Cart. Uh, before I throw it to you, though, would you mind if I do something real quick? Please. So I said before the game, when we had to make our predictions, I said that Indiana would cover, and I said that Indiana would win this basketball game. Is that true? You did. Kind of seems as if that take has deservedly given me some egg on my face, right? Just a wee bit, yep. This is an egg. This is my face. Don't you do it, Greg. That's insane, man. Zag on my face. That's absolutely insane. That's what just happened, Cart. There's egg on my face. Now I will do a Purdue recap with egg on my face. Low key, the egg yolk's doing crazy numbers on your hair right now. Like, actually, in a good way. <laughs> man, I hope it's good for skincare or something. I don't know. You're the guy who showers three times a day. So I'm going to need your answer on that. Mal's going to be very annoyed with me when she yeah. hears oh, yeah. there's, there's egg yolk all over. Um, hold on. Sorry. Let me just clean up for a second here. Uh, okay. Let's get to the recap. What'd you think of this game? All right. So, uh, great win by Purdue. Um, I thought that they came in as the more prepared team, um, just like just from like a rivalry perspective. Um, you always expect rivalries to kind of be like play closer, play closer. Um, scores and records go out the window, spreads and things like that go out the window. Um, I thought Purdue did a great job early on of establishing their national player of the year. Um, I thought that Lance Jones was locked in from the tip tonight. He played a, a great game. I think he was Purdue's second best player in this game, probably. But you can maybe even make an argument for first best because, you know, Zach Eady was great tonight, but Zach Eady also missed some shots that he usually hits. Like Zach Eady could have had a 45 in this game if he made some of the hook shots he usually hits. But um, I, I, I had trouble coming on how I want to word this. And I tried to throw out a tweet saying how I wanted to word it. The officiating in this game was terrible. The officiating did not affect the outcome of the game whatsoever. It doesn't matter what happened with the officiating, whether you think the calls were good, one-sided, whatever you want to say. Obviously, Purdue fans are going to push back and say one thing. Other people are going to push back and say another thing. It's going to be different perspectives coming from everywhere. Objectively speaking, I thought the officiating tonight was bad. More so in the first half, evened out in the second half a little bit. With that said, that did not affect the outcome of the game because Purdue wins this game regardless. Like, Purdue won this game by 21. If the calls go the other way, they probably still win by, like, 21 or more or maybe less. But with that said, they win the basketball game. But I think you could say that while also saying that the officiating in this game was – it was bad. In the first – and, like, noticeably bad, in my opinion. Yes. Uh, let's talk officiating. And then uh, obviously there's a whole game to get to that is outside of the officiating. But to me, truly, am, like in my heart from what I saw in that game, honestly, uh, I, I don't know how you tell the story of this game without officiating. And that goes both sides. I, I think there's two different elements to why officiating played a big role in this game. Uh, both teams in the first half, for the first 10 minutes of this game, the tone of this game, the energy of this game set by both offenses was much more we are playing for foul calls than it was we are trying to score. And that goes both ways. Like I can name you specific times uh, when Peyton Sparks came into this game. He was immediately trying to draw Zach Eadie's second. When Xavier Johnson was in this game, he was flailing around, flopping, falling, 
trying to draw fouls on Zach Eady. It was clear that Indiana's game plan was to try and get Zach Eady in foul trouble. That's a perfectly okay game plan. Teams should have that game plan. That's that's something. But Zach Eady's really good at not fouling. So he picked up two fouls total in this game. I thought one of his two was honestly kind of iffy in the second half. But um, for the most part, like, it just outside of Mbako getting hot early and then immediately going to the bench with two fouls, everything Indiana tried to do offensively was get bailed out by the whistle. And while that was happening, Purdue was, in my opinion, doing a similar thing. Like, Fletcher Lawyer was falling around. There was a loose ball at half court where Braden Smith dove. And in my opinion, he dove for a call instead of diving for the ball. Now, there was a loose ball in the second half where Zach Eady dove for the ball. There's a difference. And Braden Smith was trying to draw contact and get hit, basically, and go down. Um, I, it was it was messy. It was really, really, really messy from a sense of we're going to try and bait the officials. And I think that set the tone for the officials to lose control of the game. And I think that's what happened from there. Um, now, what did that look like tangibly for the the impact on the game? It looked like Indiana getting seven fouls before the under 12 to Purdue getting one foul. And look, foul discrepancy is not – something that should always be 50-50. It's not. The the team that plays Purdue, more often than not, will foul Purdue because that's the best way to stop Zach Eady. So I'm not here saying it should have been 7-7 foul calls. I am here saying that Indiana having three of their top four players with two fouls by the under 12 was insane. Uh, and I, I don't know explicitly if that's how it broke down. I know this. They had five players, Cart. Five of Indiana's top seven players had two fouls at halftime in this game. And they were auto bench. Mackenzie Mbako and uh Kalel Ware were, were auto benched in this game. And again, stepping back, Purdue was beating Indiana when they left the game due to foul trouble. So we're saying all this not to say Purdue would not have won this game. They would have won this game. It would have been a decisive win, even if the calls were more evened out. But as the game wore on, man, Robbie Hummel was calling it out. A Purdue legend was calling it out. How many individual calls, one by one, were the wrong call. Not even iffy. The wrong call going in favor of Purdue. And at the end of the game, I think you could tally it up. To be honest with you, I was tallying it up. And I know that's stupid. It makes me sound bitter. But at the end of the game, I had eight calls that went objectively wrong for Purdue and two calls that went objectively wrong for Indiana. That is way too much of a discrepancy. I don't care about other calls outside of that. If he calls, they go either way, whatever. But calls that are just flat out wrong can't be 80% in one team's favor and 20% in one team's favor. And quite frankly, this is the type of thing you would expect the home team to get. Like, at least, and I'm not saying I wish it would have happened, but at least if it happened to the home team in this spot, there's some justification of like, it's the home team refs. Like, we've seen that happen before, and it's at least explainable. There's nothing in my brain that explains how Purdue got the whistle they got tonight. I, I don't understand it. I thought it was insane, and I thought Indiana doubled and tripled down on it by trying to play for foul calls that they weren't getting, and ultimately it led to them being, what, down 51 to 27 at half, I think? Like, yeah, and, and, and it led to a lot of dumb fouls by Indiana, too. Like, yeah. it, 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 for the first half, like I found myself watching, like this game sucks to watch. Like it, it was just annoying to watch. Like it really was. And, um, like I said, you always gotta say, you always gotta say to yourself, as long as officiating doesn't change the outcome of the game, like as a whole in the bigger picture, you just gotta chalk it up as a win in college basketball. So I take a step back and I say that at the end of this, it didn't affect the outcome of the game. But it did make the game really like a tough watch throughout, especially in the first half. Uh, it, it was really rough to watch. But at the end of the day, um, you know, Purdue was the better team. Purdue has Zach Eady. Lance Jones stepped up. Fletcher Lawyer hit some timely shots. Uh, Braden went two for 14 in this game, and they still won this game by 20 points. Uh, Zach Eady had 33 and 33 and 15, I believe, 33 and 16. Um, while missing some shots, I think he usually makes like they were, he was technically off in this game, uh, quote unquote. So this game could have got really, really out of hand. Um, 
if it if it needed to. Uh, there was a fake comeback by Indiana in the second half. I also just want to say that for all the chatter about Indiana's backcourt and what they are like defensively and how good they were like coming into the season, they are the worst backcourt in the Big Ten. <laughs> they they are no, they are the worst backcourt in the Big Ten. Michigan in away games is worse, but that's the only way. Without suspensions and schoolwork, Indiana is the worst backcourt in the Big Ten, and that is a damn shame for an Indiana team to have that title. Yeah, and Indiana fans, I think, could see it coming. Like, anyone who talked about Indiana in the offseason, like, it was – it's not a surprise that their guards are bad, right? Like, it's it's pretty obvious that their guards are bad. Um, so, okay, have we done enough on the officiating? I don't want that to be the whole video. I want to like draw a line and say we're going to move on and not keep speaking on it. Do you have anything else you want to add on officiating? Okay. Um, no. Me either. I think I'm good with that. Uh, moving on. You mentioned Edie was, quote, a little bit off. Um, I don't know if I think that's the right phrase, but I think it's a fair one. He missed a lot of shit I think we've seen him make. The bottom line is that it speaks to just how damn great he is. Like, this is why I'm going to constantly preach that this guy's the most generational player I've seen in my life in college basketball. He's on the season 63% from the floor. Tonight, he shoots below 50% from the floor. 11 for 23. That doesn't happen often. I don't know that I can even name you the last game without going through his game logs. Like, let me let me try and find you the last game. Zach Eady made less than half his shots from the floor. Oh, wait, I can't. He hasn't done that this season. Let me go back to last year. It was the Ohio State game in the Big Ten tournament. He went 12 for 25 from the floor. So he's got one game in a calendar year where this man's made less than half his shots. Uh, Tonight, he does it on the road against Indiana. And he still finishes with 33 because he shot 12 free throws and made 11 of them. Like, he's unstoppable. Uh, I thought you're right. Like, I think if the shots he took in this game, he takes again, and you just simulate the game play it the same way, he probably finishes with, like, 45. Like, he was very close to having a 45-point game tonight. Yeah, you you don't want to – I use the phrase a lot when I talk about, like, just sports in general. Don't – ever take like generational stuff for granted like don't take it for granted that you get to watch Zach Eady play basketball at the, and play college basketball like he is a generational college basketball player and you need to realize that and like I said because he's generational and he's that good him going 12 for 23 I'm like eh bad Zach Eady game 33 and 16 okay Eady game He was a little bit off. Like, that's how generational he is as a basketball player. And it's honestly, and I think maybe I appreciate it more just being being in my, you know, getting my former post player bag. It is not easy whatsoever. Like, people think like, oh, Edie's just getting layups. Edie's just getting dunks. It is not as easy as you think to have that type of touch, um, like, on hook shots and shots that he takes. Like, his ability to have the touch at his size and have the feet that he has at his size is – is special and yes i get it he's seven four like whatever keep your he's just big comments to yourself anyone who's saying that now should be actually reprimanded in some form or fashion by the actual like law enforcement i i, we, I can't handle it anymore on twitter they should be locked up somewhere or put on probation but i mean zach Eady's just generational it is what it is it's gonna be like that for the rest of the season it's gonna go back to back national player of the year and at the end of the day that's gonna take purdue very far yep yeah, I mean, end of the day, you got him on your team. You have a great chance to win a national championship. It's just what it is. Uh, the other guy, I, really two other guys from Purdue, I think warrant a little bit of mention here. Uh, this was Lance Jones' best game of the season to me. Now, scoring-wise, I think it definitely was. He finishes with 17, efficient 17. Four for five from inside the arc, three for seven from three. He didn't do much else in the box score, but he didn't need to. I like that version of Lance. People might get mad at me for that, but I would love a Lance Jones that just finishes every game with zero turnovers and one assist. He doesn't need to do more than that. You have an elite point guard passer and you have an elite big man. Just make shots, take good shots, slash a little bit and defend. That's what I want from Lance Jones. I don't want anything louder than that. I thought he was stellar tonight. I thought there were stretches where he was the best player on the floor for Purdue tonight. Do you agree with me there? Yeah, I agree. I think he was easily the second best player on Purdue for the whole game. 
And you can make an argument that he was the best player, honestly, in this game. Because Braden was off. And I like I stated just a second ago, I think Edie was a little bit off. I know it sounds crazy to say. I'm going to stop repeating it because it sounds crazier every time I say it. But Lance was very impressive tonight. I thought that he did a great job of taking good shots. Uh, I honestly only counted. I like to do like the Lance Jones, like bad, bad shot three counter. I counted one where he took a quick one, a deep one on an offensive rebound. But at the same time, best time to shoot a three is on an offensive rebound kick out. It was a little bit early. I didn't like it. But besides that, everything was great. He did a great job of getting on transition, finishing at the rim. He had some very strong takes in this game, getting it over shot blockers and Ware and Baco and and uh, Renew. So, yeah, it was it was a very impressive Lance Jones game. That was his best game. I think I've seen him play as a Boilermaker. And and it goes back to what I talked about in the preview. Um, and people might have been surprised about it, but that's like I trusted Lance Jones in this game. Like I trusted Lance Jones to come out and play in a rivalry game, in a big game, and do what is needed to do to get his team to win. And that's exactly what he did. He executed his role to perfection and it, it, it led to a big win. That's the moment I should have known my Indiana money line bet was cooked. The moment that you said you trust Lance Jones in this game for the record, but great call by you. Uh, he was really good. The other guy you said you predicted a big game from was Fletcher lawyer. He finishes with 19 points, four for four from three point range. Uh, this to me is a great game indication of why I'm never going to tolerate the games where flesh just gets benched. I'm not going to tolerate it because there isn't a guy on the bench that can do this. And he is that important to the Purdue offense. Uh, you, you just need to get him to a spot where even if he misses his first three threes, you trust him enough to stay on the floor because he can rattle off four straight any given game. He's got a knack for big games. I think, honestly, I think people have been worried about, like, our guy's going to be afraid to shoot the basketball. Shouldn't feel that way with Fletch. Just shouldn't. Like, we've now seen him in big games show up and hunt shots and knock them down consistently. He had the big one when things were getting dicey. Indiana made that run where he kind of, like, ball faked, took a second, reset himself, and hit a dagger. Uh, I thought he was great tonight. And, again, a great case of a guy who didn't need to do more than his role because of how Purdue is built, but he was stellar in that role. Yeah, he was. And and that's why you, you know, for him to have the ability to come into assembly hall and shoot that well from three is, is just impressive. And it's, in, it's indicative of who Fletch is. And, you know, I saw some, uh, some commentary on, you know, what was going on early because Mbako had a few early baskets. Um, and I believe that Fletcher was guarding him and it, it's just like, well, one, if I was paying, I would have just threw Fletch on cardio cups and then put Lance Jones on Mbako. I thought he would have been fine. I thought Braden would have been fine on, on, on Galloway, to be honest with you. But Fletcher just gives you so much offensively and so much of what this team needs to offensively. That's, that's the main takeaway. Fletcher should never be have games where he's benched. I'm sorry. I like, I, and I get it that, People can attack him on defense. There's also other people on the floor that they can attack on defense. And starting with Purdue's point guard that gets attacked on defense a lot, by the way. But yeah. he doesn't get bent, he doesn't get benched for it. And I get it. Braden's a table setter. I understand that. But I will forever scream to the heavens, to the Mackey rooftops, that Fletch needs to play. Fletch is the third best player on this basketball team. And he needs to play. And when he plays, he's going to knock down shots. And if he misses the first couple, he's probably going to hit the next one. He's a 40% three-point shooter for a reason. He's earned the right to play and shoot, honestly, any shot he wants from a three-point range because he's yep. that good. And they need that. They need that from him. Tonight, you got it from Jones and Lawyer. And uh, ultimately, they they only needed three players offensively in this game to really do what they needed to do. Um, trying to think if there's anything else from the Purdue side we want to hit on quickly that was major before we get to the uh, – the elephant in the room. Um, Ethan Morton gave him a few good minutes. Uh, Cam Heidi was not ready for a game like this. He had nine very empty minutes. We kind of called that one. Caleb first, only seven minutes, but he got a couple free throws, a couple rebounds. All in all, Purdue's bench didn't do much, and I'm okay with that for the record. Um, I, I think Purdue's in a point where their rotation is so good, you just got to lean on the dogs, and they've been doing that, and that's a good thing. Uh, now, Braden Smith. Uh, struggled. Want to choose my words carefully here. He did have nine assists. It's only two turnovers. That's obviously great. He does that 
often. He's very capable of that. If you were going to look for one big mark to be concerned about with Braden, it would probably be turnovers. So at the end of this game, we can't even be overly upset with his missed shots, I don't think, because he didn't turn the ball over. He took care of it, and that's all Purdue needed in this spot. With that said, he was 2 for 14 from the floor, finishes with five points. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, both of his two-point shots, both his made shots, were elbow jumpers, his little pull-up. And I think towards the end of the game, too. Yeah, I I think most of his misses were like runners over Khalil Ware and kind of off balance flip shots going closer to the rim. Uh, My stance on this is Braden needs to shoot the pull up way more than he is. I don't think he shot it enough tonight. I know it's the box score says he took 14 shots. I don't think nearly enough of those were the pull up. And I think the pull ups always wide open. It's always wide open. That's his best shot. He should shoot it 10 times a game. He'll probably hit eight of them. When he tries the other stuff, the floaters, the runners, I know they have worked in this season and last season. He's really good at that too. But against a shot blocker like Ware when he was in the game and even Mackenzie and Baco, that's a really tough shot. It's just a tough shot, especially when your own seven foot six dudes in the paint. Like when you're that little, that, that's a much tougher shot than a wide open pull up. And teams guard him, daring him to take the wide open pull up every time. So I didn't have a problem that he was two for 14. I had a problem with the type of shots that he didn't take in this game compared to the shots that he did. What did you see on why Braden struggled? Uh, Well, I I think it was a little bit of, um, uh, I guess the word would be self-awareness and what he should be doing. Like to me in this game, the elbow jumper, the mid-range jumper, which he is really good at, by the way, like I I have confidence that that shot's going to go down for him. I thought that that would have been the higher percentage shot than the floaters and the runners at the rim. Now, at the same time, those floaters and runners that he missed ended up in a lot of Zach Eady offensive rebounds and makes and other rebounds by Gillis and TKR in this game. And I get that. Like, sometimes getting it up on the rim is just as good as him making a play. But um, I, I I definitely think that the mid-range and elbow jumper is something that he, he should do a lot more of, especially because he's so good at it. And also to comment on the the turnover thing for, for you uh, that you brought up, to me, in that second half, when Indiana was making that little bit of a comeback, and I know, I know, I'm gonna get the stop nit nitpicking Braden. Like obviously, he didn't turn the ball over, but it was about how when I was watching it, he just seemed very sped up, very kind of erratic, and he wasn't turning the ball over, so it didn't really hurt him. But he just looked very sped up, and it kind of threw off the whole team a little bit, and that's why some of the shots that were happening early in the second half just seemed like a little bit out of sync. And to me, that starts with Braden because he's a point guard and because he can be a table setter and control the pace. I thought he was a little bit, not necessarily sped up, but maybe a little bit and just a little bit erratic. Um, Now, obviously, it didn't lead to turnovers and he had the assist numbers, so it's not anything detrimental. But as I was watching it, especially in the second half early on, I I found myself saying that Braden might just need to slow down a little bit or just do a better job of controlling the pace. I just thought he was kind of doing like some curly Neil globetrotter dribbling around, dribbling all over the place. And yes, some of it turned out good, but it just, it threw off the rhythm a little bit to me. Would you use the D word to describe Braden Smith's offensive game tonight? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. The the demons word. Yeah. And he needs, sometimes you need to just have one game to shake those. I, 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 put this or I put this in terms of what happened to like my all American point guard Cassius Winston had some demons that he had to get over with Michigan and Xavier Simpson. That was a real thing. And it had nothing to do with him as a great player. He was an all American, one of the greatest point guards in Michigan state history. He saw demons early on in his career when he was playing Michigan, even when he was playing at a high level. Now he settled some of those demons towards the end, surely. And some of those games that he had, but it's a, it's a real thing. And obviously, Braden's going to be at Purdue for two more years. He's going to play. He's going to have his chance to play Indiana again. And I would bet money that he exercises those demons that he has against this team and, you know, is able to uh, play play the level of basketball he's capable of. But also at the same time, you know, the, the I don't think the demons word with him is – uh, you could throw it out the window. I think it's pretty evident in his his play against Indiana so far. Well, luckily they got the win though. That's all that matters. Yeah, I actually want to do something with the demons word we keep throwing around. Um, I think we have to retire the word demons, 
but we need to replace it with the word Bradens. It's the Bradens. It's a case of the Bradens because case of, case the, of the, Braden. the demons did not affect anybody else. And I think uh, trying to conflate Indiana specific demons with Purdue's late game erratic stuff, there's one common denominator in the last year and a half, right? Isn't it just Braden? Like, I, I, I think we're kind of past the point of worrying about other guys on this team. Um, and I love Braden Smith. I want to be clear about that. I think he's the, at worst, fourth best player in this conference. I think he's a superstar. There's nobody in the conference I'd rather take to be the the centerpiece of my program going forward for the next two and a half years. Um, but he's he's got some very real stuff there. Like, I, he a lot of, in my opinion, his play tonight that went poorly on the offensive end with him and his own shots was pretty self-enforced. Like, I, I don't think anyone guarding Braden Smith caused him to miss those shots. I don't think he was forced into those shots, really. I think he just was taking tough ones and passing up or dribbling past open ones that he's better at. And I don't know what you do with that, but you're going to need, uh, uh, like, obviously, this goes without saying, in the NCAA tournament, you're going to play teams that are better than Indiana. So y- you can't have this type of performance, no matter how good Jones and Lawyer and Edie are. Um, and I love the Cassius Winston poll from you. I love that poll because you're right. Winston, uh, yeah, he was. I think he was one in three to start his career in the Michigan rivalry and then ended yeah. up sweeping Michigan three times later. Crazy to think about it, too. We have at minimum five more Braden Smith Indiana games. Like, that's yeah. that's crazy. He has a long way to go in his career and a long way to write his story as a Purdue Boilermaker. Um, from the Indiana side of things, there was one thing that they did tonight or that worked for them that I think opened my eyes to, oh, this is a way a team could actually exploit Purdue a little bit. Mackenzie Mbako had a smaller guy guarding him the whole game. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know that there's many teams in the country that can exploit that, but I do think like if something that came to mind as I was watching this, like if Kansas was playing Purdue, who's guarding Kevin McCuller? Like there, there are teams that have two small guards that are dynamic that are going to require Lance Jones to guard one of them that also have a three that's just going to eat Fletcher Lawyer alive or whoever else is there. And uh, Mbako, I thought, started out great. He had seven points before the first media timeout, and then he got auto-benched, and then he checked back into the game down 24. So (laughs) it was kind of hard. Like, I think he was on his pace to have a legacy moment maybe, and then it just didn't happen. Um, Do you agree with me that that's something that maybe could concern Purdue fans going forward? Uh, I don't know if I'd raise like actual concerns just because with Indiana's offense, it just, uh, and I hate that it's like on repeat and it's just so hard to find spacing. Like anytime Re- Renew caught it on the block, there was five guys in the paint. It's just so hard for them to operate. And I thought that Mbako did do a good job of knocking it down. And I think that's going to be, and, and when I, and okay, also I want to say this, when we say like something to, attack Purdue that means nothing as far as the outcome of the game we're just trying to find maybe ways that other teams will try to approach it to give them a shot because you're going up against the Zachities of the world and you know I think part of it is that one you when you're playing a great team you got to be able to knock down shots that that's for starters like you got to be able to knock down shots at a reasonable clip Indiana did not do that and also you got to exploit the matchup where you have the matchup advantage. And I, I agree with you that having the matchup at the three position, um, I think would be the best way to attack it or just any way that you can attack the matchup that is, you know, that is uh, most, most beneficial, kind of like the way Northwestern did it. Like they went hunting Heidi, they went hunting Fletcher lawyer and they were able to make plays off of that and knock down shots. But unfortunately if plays were made, they were kicking the CJ gun and Anthony Walker and dropping off the Peyton Sparks as he chucked it at the backboard. So it, it's just it's an indictment on this Indiana <laughs> roster somewhat. Yeah, Indiana's very bad. They have very serious issues. We've talked about them all year. The guard play, you're right, is the worst in the conference. Um, but like they are even worse when you have to bench two of their three best players due to foul for the whole half. Like I and I don't want to go back to the foul stuff. We said we weren't going to do it, but I, I don't know how you tell the story of this. Like in our discord, there was a lot of like, you know, defensively, we're really forcing them into tough shots. Like, no, like Anthony Walker taking a fadeaway two is the best shot they can get when they have their three best players auto bench. 
Like that's, it just is the story of what it is. Like there, there is no schematic defense needed to guard Indiana when they can't play where or Mbako due to foul. Now maybe Woodson should have played them through the foul trouble. They both only finished with uh, three fouls max and Baco didn't even pick up a second one, but I don't know. Like their their bench isn't good enough. This this roster is too front heavy, front loaded in the front court. There's there's no dynamic ball handlers, shooters, none of it. So they were uh, really drawing dead once the foul trouble became a thing. Uh, Malik Renu needed to be a lot better. He was the one big that didn't get in foul trouble until late in the game, and he never would have gotten benched for it. He played 35 minutes. He finishes with eight points, nine rebounds, three assists to a turnover, four for ten from the floor. Uh, we've seen some incredible Renew performances this year, like really incredible. This was not one. What does that mean to you? He, I mean, I, I think that he missed some ones that he typically makes, but also I cannot emphasize this enough. He had zero space to operate. I mean, absolutely zero. Like they cut off the baseline and usually TKR or whoever or the other big or someone else would come over and they'd be somebody in the lane. There'd be somebody digging down because they literally had no, there was no threat at all outside of anybody else to, uh, to knock down a shot in this game. Like there is no, there is no reason why you can't just help and blitz uh, the bigs on this team. So it, it's, it's a, it's a problem. It's a problem that's not fixable either. That's the thing. Don't mean to be doom and gloom Indiana fans, but like, <laughs> Y'all are cooked. I'm sorry. I know we're gonna stop using the cook word on here, but like, it's scary hours in the in the tin, as you like to refer to it as. Yeah, yeah, not going up in the tin right now. Tough, tough times for sure. Um, oof. okay. Let's have the Xavier Johnson conversation. You can't is, play him. Is there a worst guard in the country right now than Xavier Johnson? You cannot play him. You can't play him. He's he is unplayable at this point, unfortunately, and it's sad. It is, um, but he he's unplayable. What is going on? <laughs> like, because okay, let me let me just set the table a little more, so I'm not just leaving you out to dry here. Uh, Xavier Johnson tonight: zero points, zero assists, two turnovers, three fouls, one of them a flagrant. He's not starting. He's coming off the bench behind Cardio Cups, uh, who is actually fine in this game i thought i thought this was one of game cups his better games of the season he hit that nice little pull up and a three uh but xavier johnson is is completely unplayable he had an offensive rating tonight of nine nine single digit nine offensive rating absurd uh the flagrant was crazy we've done all the officiating talk we haven't talked about that i still don't know how that was a flagrant he was out of the play uh yes he put an arm into zach Eady's chest the number of times an arm goes into a chest in a box out situation in a game is usually a hundred, but he was a disaster outside of that, which I think he got because of his reputation from the last game. Um, he was flopping around constantly. Like we saw the, the go to the locker room fall off the Zach Eady screen. That wasn't a flop. He just didn't see it coming. He got hit in the head, but like he was flailing and flopping five other times in this game. He's on the court to flop, to cheap shot. He's not passing. He's not making shots. He's turning the ball over at an insane rate. He's trying behind the back layups in transition that end up getting swatted by Ethan Morton. Like, I just, it, it, I don't know if he's in his own head. I don't know if he's just toxic. I don't know if he's still hurt or what it is. But the body language is awful. He already wasn't a positive contributor coming into this. And now, to me, in my opinion, there is not a guard in the country playing worse basketball than Xavier Johnson. Yeah, I I, I don't think that's up for argument either. And, and it's unfortunate. It truly is. Because for everything that anyone feels about Xavier Johnson, like he's battled injuries his last season playing college basketball, I believe, I hope. Um, and he right now he's going out kind of sad. And even as not even a fan of the team, you never want to see a guy go out sad in their career um, to the point where they're unplayable. And, and right now he's unplayable. Uh, in the last couple games, he, he either, I mean, you got to think he's maybe hurt or something. That's how bad he's been. But he's just been, he's been unplayable. Uh, every time I watch him play these past couple games, I think I'm watching the point guard version of Mati Sissoko. Like that's that's kind of what he plays like. Yeah. Yeah. Except Mott is getting rebounds. 
True. Yeah, he's at least doing tangible things on a basketball court. Um, yeah, I don't know. Xavier Johnson, I, I I never can erase the memory of him in the Big Ten tournament a couple of years ago when he was awesome. He was awesome, and he really kind of led a Trace Jackson Davis team into the NCAA tournament when they were a bubble team. And there's always been hope he could be that for a full season, despite the injury concerns. Uh, it just never has come together. But I don't know, man. Like, my my passing memory of that with him was not even how good he was on the court. It was, like, how much of a leader he was and a rah-rah guy and the heart of the team and the emotion in a good way that galvanized the other players. And that's disappeared. I mean, that's now the only thing he brings to this team is chaos, flops, and flagrance. Like, I, I don't know what you do with it. Um, he kind of has cemented himself as an all time tough guy when things are going well and dirty player when things are not going well. Um, and tonight was just really, really bad. You can't, you can't do all that extra nonsense and give your team zero and zero as a point guard as the only point guard. And I don't know what Mike Woodson does. He clearly is sticking with him on the bench right now, but it's not leading to any better play from him. So, um, Nothing would surprise me anymore with where Xavier Johnson's season goes from here. Uh, that was heavy, man. I don't like just shitting on a kid like that. Yeah, but... me either. And like, and that's kind of why I threw it out there. Like, I feel, I feel bad. I truly feel bad because I feel like one, he's probably in his own head. Now he's probably piling on himself, and he's coming out here and he can't do anything. People are visibly groaning when he shoots jumpers, which. I also can't blame them for because now the shot looks weird. I mean, he already had a weird jumper to begin with, but now it's like, it looks even worse. I, yeah, I don't know. It's just, you, you, you but as a coach, you can't play him. And maybe Mike Woodson pulls him to the side of this game and says, Xavier, like, look, man, I, I, I love you. I do. Like you're my point guard. I, I brought you back. I put all my eggs into the Xavier Johnson basket, but you're like, you're killing us out here. And I can't play you if you're going to continue to do this. And you know, you bring him off the bench, you give him some, maybe you, you don't have really have any other guard options. So you got to see what he can go out there and do. But at a certain point, the coach is going to have to make a tough decision and be like, yeah, I, we just can't play you. You just, you do nothing but hurt the team when you're on the floor. And that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. It's a complete disaster. Um, Mike Woodson had a quote in the post game. Uh, I want to try and find it real quick. Um, he was basically shitting on Khalil Ware. Uh, He said this. Weird. Yeah, he said this in the post game. He said, um, I thought Ware could have done a better job defending Edie, but he didn't. That's what Mike Woodson said in the post game. This is now a consistent run of Mike Woodson very pointedly throwing his players under the bus. He's done it with Ware. Uh, he's definitely done it with Xavier Johnson. I don't know that he's done it with others, but I, I might have missed sometimes because I feel like I've seen it pop up on my timeline where he's done it with other guys. Um, your thoughts. It's always weird which player he chooses to throw under the bus to. Like, I, I don't know. Where wouldn't have been the player I threw under the bus tonight? There's more. I'm just fine. He said, we couldn't get to Edie quick enough. I didn't think Ware played tough enough. Hmm. I mean, I just don't know if I agree. I just don't know if that's I just don't know if that's true, to be honest with you. I mean, he got into foul trouble, which threw him off, but otherwise I really don't know what what else he really could have done. Yeah, here's my issue with it. Um here's my issue with it. I don't think Mike Woodson knows who any of his players are. I don't think he knows what they're good at, what they're bad at. I don't think he has a clue. I think that's the only justification for why he built this roster into what it is. Because if your game plan tonight was predicated on Khalil Ware's toughness in stopping the national player of the year, then you got the result you deserved. That's not who Khalil Ware is. He's not tough. He's not tough enough for anybody, let alone the national player of the year. Like, that that's just not his game. And I feel like Woodson's made comments like he, like he doesn't understand who Xavier Johnson is. We have more than enough data at this point on who these players are. And it's Woodson's job to like mold them into something better, to transform them, to get them better, not to just go to the post game and like act like they're not doing things. They're just not good at doing like it would, it literally would be like Tom Izzo hitting the podium and well, well he does this quite frankly, but it's like our center's got to catch the ball. 
Your centers can't catch the ball, dude. Like, I I, it, I don't know who needs to tell him this, but I, I'm baffled by it. I feel bad for Indiana fans because uh, I don't think Woodson's doing himself any favors taking this approach. Yeah, I don't – like, it's <laughs> – it's like the picture, like we're all trying to find out who's responsible for this. You're responsible for it. Yeah. Like you did, and you, you know, you bring you bring up like this toughness thing. You preach toughness. Well, go out there and get guys that are are tough then, or get guys that are talented. Like I had to watch as an Indiana fan, I would have been sick to my stomach that we're down 20 to our rival before the, before the even halftime strikes, and then we're down 20 again late in the second half. And the seven four national player of the year is diving on the floor for the ball while everyone else on my team looks at each other and looks around and he throws a pass to Lance Jones for a layup. And then he's out here waving bye-bye to your crowd on your home floor. Like where's like, you always talk about like fans talking about uh, toughness and pride. There was none from Indiana tonight. That was, that's, that was a classic fake effort, fake tough guy run to cut the game to like 12, but there was no toughness shown in that game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the lingering moment for me, which is another Zach Eady moment I appreciate is loose ball. He's up 20 points with like four minutes left and Zach Eady's on the floor getting the loose ball while Khalil Ware is bending over trying to pick it up. Right. Um, it, it is rare, man. It's rare that you have a player as good as Zach Eady. Obviously rare. You have a player as big as he is who really does play as hard as he does. Like, I, I don't want to take that part of this for granted. Like he, He's one of one. He's always going to be one of one. I'm thankful that we get to watch him in the way he plays because it's. I know there's a lot of dialogue about is it fun to watch him, is it not? Other fans don't seem to appreciate him. I think we can objectively say as non-Purdue fans who saw problems with the officiating tonight, we love watching Zach Eady, man. Like I, I cannot get enough of watching this kid and the way he plays basketball. Yeah, 100%. You don't, yeah. don't take great – never take greatness for granted. Never. Were you uh, speaking of never taking greatness for granted? Did you love Braden Smith's uh, wave bye bye after his two for fourteen night? I feel like that's, that's a you, that's a you move. Yeah, that is that is a me move, and I very 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 much commend him for doing so. I think I've seen that exact move from you in men's league highlights before, where you cut him up and you tell me, "Yeah, I didn't have it tonight, but check this moment out." <laughs> like, you damn skippy. Yeah, we've seen that one. Uh, final thing I'm Purdue in Indiana for me. Uh, I believe it was Dana O'Neill who did this. I, I don't want to butcher the name and get it wrong. Um, not that I don't know who Dana O'Neill is, but I believe it was her who wrote this article this morning. It was about Purdue and Indiana's rivalry and how things have shifted from kids used to grow up wanting to go to Indiana. That was the dream. You know, you're shooting on the outdoor hoops in the state and you dream of putting on the candy stripes. And Indiana's lack of relevance in the sport, their lack of final four runs, their lack of March success, their lack of big 10 success has now led to a place where it's different, where people dream of going to Purdue and not Indiana. There were some numbers used in that report that I found interesting. Um, I did read the article. It is a good article. You should read it. I, I don't disagree with the conclusion. I might disagree with how she got there. That's it. Um, but what what do you think? Do you think that's a fair thing to say that like kids used to dream of going to Indiana and playing basketball, and now they dream of going to Purdue? Uh, I don't know about dream of going. I just I just don't think they dream of going to Indiana. And I know Purdue fans aren't going to like that, but at the same time, I just think that Indiana had a clear advantage on pulling Indiana kids based off candy stripes and history. But now that's not how it works. And I don't know if that's going to Purdue or going elsewhere, but it's it's not Indiana. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, Purdue, there's no arguing that Purdue is like a way healthier program and will be the, oh, 100%. For the foreseeable future. So I think uh, I wouldn't draw any drastic conclusions because like Indiana is still recruiting well. They've been recruiting well. They, I mean, Khalil Ware was a top notch transfer Liam McNeely's coming in he's top notch freshman Butch Fino was a top notch like they're they're recruiting well so I don't think it's fair to like conclude that Indiana's not getting players the way they used to but um I would say this very clearly whether it's people dream of Purdue and not Indiana now growing up in the state I don't know I don't I don't live in the state I couldn't tell you I can bet you kids dream of playing for Matt Painter. 
I can tell you nobody in the state of Indiana dreams of playing for Mike Woods. Facts. That's Big just facts. the truth. That's uh, facts. So I think that's going to continue for as long as Painter is here. All right. Congrats, Purdue fans. Any final thoughts from you, Car? I really cracked an egg on my face. Yeah, you did. I'm not cracking an egg on anything, and I'm also standing on all 10 toes business with any Purdue fan. Just know that. What does that mean? Just know I'm standing on business. Are you about to, like, go fight in your mentions or something? Are we getting blown up? I haven't looked. No, I mean, I obviously, I, I'm getting blown up no matter what. I put myself in a position where I'm I'm going to get blown up whether I say anything, so... It is what it is. I'm gonna con- I'm gonna continue to voice my opinion and try to be objective as I possibly can, and I do a damn good job at it. So, you know, shout out to Boiler Nine Two Nine who's calling me bad words though repeatedly. I appreciate you. You would have been proud of me at the Lions game. Uh, repeatedly, I kept screaming, "It's not about you, Stripes," or like that was that was the angle. Anytime it was a dead ball, anything, it's like. It's not about you, Stripes. That's all it is. Uh, Tonight, it was unequivocally about Stripes. (laughs) Yeah, it was. It was Zach Eady, Lance Jones, Stripes. And also how good Purdue is, too. But Yeah, really good. But also the Stripes. Yes. Should Purdue have their own version of Candy Stripes? Honestly, like some Candy Stripe gold and black pants would kind of slap. Follow me on, like... The caramel stripes. They do better. They would do better than what Indiana's putting on the court right now. Hmm. The workshop that we'll think on it. We'll report back. Congrats, pretty fans. Goodbye.